Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Wednesday, February 26th, 2014. This is the 404 Show. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Jeff Bacalar. And I'm Justin Yu. We've got Ariel Nunez once again. Michaelis in the back. But look who's over his shoulder. Aunt Jill is here. She's our first audience member we've ever had for the program. <laughs> Live audience, and she's here today to watch uh, someone we've been talking about for a very long time, and we're finally glad you're here, sir, Mr. Uh, Dr. Josh King. Thank you. Thank you for being here, man. My pleasure. This is a big deal. We've been talking about this for like a month. You're uh, an addiction psychologist at the Center for Motivation and Change. We've asked our audience to really sort of put together questions about addiction, uh, internet addiction, any real kind of addiction that they think could be an issue for them. They've opened up their hearts, right? So we have to honor that transparency by uh, helping some people through some stuff. Oh, I so, sure hope so. So before we get into um, some of those specific questions from our listeners, can you give us sort of like a background of, of what it is you specifically do at the uh, Center for Motivation and Change? Sure. So the Center for Motivation and Change is a group of about 25 or so uh, uh, psychologists who are all using evidence-based treatments to help people change substance abuse and compulsive behaviors. Um, and what we're really built on is this idea that everybody can change. Everybody right. has this internal way of being able to make change and that our job is really to help them figure out how to make that change. And so we use evidence-based techniques to help um, people first build up the motivation to make the change sure. and then to build up the skills that they need in order to make and maintain those changes. I like the evidence part. Yeah, that's, that's a comforting. That's a that's a good one. There's yeah. a lot of um, a lot of research has been done over the last 30, 40 years uh, that has really come up with some very effective techniques for helping people with substance abuse and compulsive behaviors. And we employ all of them. Um, right. We really work to to use the most cutting edge science to help figure out how to best help people change. Excellent. Well, we started asking people for uh, their questions and concerns about three weeks ago. We got way more, uh, 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 way more responses than I thought we would get. We'll try and get to as many as we can. We're just going to jump right in. If we if we didn't if we don't get to your question, can we like maybe just like forward them all to you or something? <laughs> How does that work? Sure, you we'll can figure something you can, out. We'll figure out some way yeah, to, to we'll get you answers. We'll give you a good rate. Don't worry. We'll figure something out. And uh, some people were anonymous. Some people weren't. We're just going to just anonymize everyone. Sounds like, that, that like the sounds, best choice. Sounds like the safest way to play this game. Okay, let's jump right in. Uh, hey, 404, I'm getting caught up on some old shows. I'm a 38-year-old single man and a severe alcoholic. I turned to alcohol to deal with the trauma of leaving the cult that I was born into and losing most of my friends and family because of it. That was over five years ago, and the pain of those events has faded, but the addiction remains. I currently drink more than a half a liter of vodka a day. Now, uh, for people who don't, that's a lot of vodka to it's drink a, lot of vodka. a day. Uh, I desperately want to quit but can't. I feel like I need some sort of support group, but largely because of how I was raised and the fact that I'm now an atheist... I find the religious nature of AA revolting, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, what would you suggest? This is this has a lot of ins and outs. We're, we're starting with a, a, right. a whop. Way to here, start man. out on something nice but, and small. <laughs> but, you, but you know what? This is you know I I really kind of respect. Well, not you know I I think the whole sort of AA thing. A lot of people don't know that AA is very sort of uh, based in faith, right? So. Let's back a lot up. of lot of stuff here. Sure, so there's a lot to tackle. AA is, um, first of all, a, a spectacular organization. For those who don't know a lot about it, um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. Sure, AA was developed in the 1930s ish, uh, 30s 40s, um, by a, a guy who Bill Wilson, who was going through his own struggles with alcohol, and at that point there was really not much that was out there for people. So he. Uh, went through and he worked with this uh, doctor out in Minnesota um, and they came up with a a plan, a way to actually help people to try and um, change their substance use, to, to deal with alcohol. Right. Right. And they came up with the, the 12 steps that they had codified and, and, and put into play and um, basically said, th follow this book, follow this way, and, and you're going to... Um, do much better. Sure. This was revolutionary at the time. Right? There was nothing. 
there. So it, it had changed the nature of substance abuse treatment at the time. Since then, there, it's helped millions of people. It's been widely uh, available, right? You can find it in almost any city in the world. You can find it. If you are on a plane, you can find a way to, if you're having t really intense cravings, you can find ways to find anybody else who's in the program. How does that work? Um, you can page, I think it's, you page Bill W., or you say that you're a friend of Bill W's and you oh, page and they say it's Bill W. And then people like other people who are in the know will be able to, huh. to come up and, and I didn't say know like, there's oh, a code. There is because right, they're very serious about the anonymous part. Yeah. They don't want, you know, people to just say, like, hey, I'm 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 struggling with alcohol right, right now. Like, I'm super triggered. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. can somebody help me out? Right. But they, they want to be able to to as a community help each other out. And the huh. community aspect of it amazing. is spectacular. Yeah. yeah. Right? I love the fact that you can go in any city in the world and say like I really need a meeting yeah. and there are meetings and in New York we are uh, a really unique place for AA because there are so many meetings here that you can literally we can find 10 meetings in a three mile radius or a 10 block radius sure even, that are going on within the next two hours right so you can find AA meetings pretty much anywhere. And that part of it is is really great. Sure. It's also really terrifying that there are that many people addicted to alcohol. Well, well I mean, the, the numbers for, for people who meet criteria to need some kind of substance abuse treatment mm -hmm. are, are staggering. It's 23 million people in the United States alone. And it's legal. And well, and well, that's that's for all uh, all substances, <laughs> for, not okay. just for alcohol. But alcohol is is legal. I mean, so if it's we start, crazy. But that doesn't include something like cigarettes. No, no. cigarettes Which is, are legal. Cigarettes are legal, and there's never like there's no AA for cigarettes. Well, the thing is, like, cigarettes won't you know get into a car and drive and you know kill somebody. No, but cigarettes will. They'll kill you, but it, it seems. But lungs. it is sort of like a mostly isolated, you know, damaging yourself sort of thing. Unless you get into second the whole secondhand smoke. But let's let's not. But let's get back to our thirty. Yeah, to let's our, get back our, to our thirty-eight-year-old buddy. So he's 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 you know he's conflicted. Mm -hmm. He he's an atheist, so he thinks AA might be right. a little. So one of the the really awesome things about AA and um, is it, it, is that each AA group is different. Right. So not every AA group is as spiritual as the next. That's mm. good to know for right. him. So one thing I would recommend for him is find out, I don't know where he lives, um, but if there are multiple AA groups available to him, check them out. Right. Try out different ones. Right. You can actually go to multiple different ones and, and see which one fits the most. Every AA group has a different feel. So that would be the first thing that I would recommend if because it's probably the most ubiquitous uh, self-help thing that's out there right for him. very accessible if that still doesn't work for him the second thing is that there is no real understanding like they don't say well you have to believe in god right it has to be god right they right. say it's a higher power sure so if you can think about higher power in a slightly different way or think about it as like <laughs> what is your higher power right, right. It, 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 that also works you so might have to suspend his disbelief a little bit of suspension of disbelief that if that still doesn't work, there are a lot of other groups out there that have nothing to do with spirituality. Sure. I highly recommend things like Smart Recovery, S-M-A-R-T. Okay. Smart Recovery is um, goes off of evidence-based techniques, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, so that you can actually be building up very specific skills. And you know, how are you going to get through this day? How are you going to do this that's not, I'm relying on a higher power, I'm, I'm uh, holding into willpower or, or trying to, to get my way through this and like do it day by day. But I'm using specific skills for, for how I'm going to get through. There's... Um, well, he's not going to go to women for sobriety, but uh, that there is a women for sobriety. There's mm -hmm. um, a, just a ton of different things out there, including things like moderation management. So if he's saying, I want to moderate, I want to give that a shot. You know, here's a group where you can go and try and figure out how that would be possible. Mm -hmm. If he goes to our website, motivationandchange.com, in the outpatient section, we actually have a list of resources uh, of um, recommended self-help groups cool. that he can check out and see a, a list of, of different ones. So that would be one part of it. The other part of it that I, I think is really important is um, for alcohol, there are certain substances that are um, really dangerous to try and stop on your own. 
Alcohol is one of them. Mm. Because if you have, if you're drinking a half a liter, it was a half a liter? Half a liter of vodka a day. If you're drinking a half liter of vodka a day, you, you probably have pretty strong um, dependence. Yeah. Mm. And, and I imagine resistance to it. Intolerance, tolerance. yeah, you've built up a lot of tolerance. So, you know, you're, you're up to a half, uh, like if I drank a half a liter of vodka, be I'd be yeah. out on the floor. Like sure. it would not be a pretty scene. Mm -hmm. He's clearly, he's functioning. He's got a high tolerance, which he built up over time. Um, but th what that means is then that he also is uh, p particularly dependent. And alcohol, uh, benzodiazepines, these are some of the ones that um, if you try to come off of them on your own, there's a possibility of having um, very, even life-threatening seizures. Wow. So I would highly recommend that he does not try to stop on oh, his own turkey, and yeah. that you go into, there are inpatient detoxes, there are some outpatient detoxes, things that you can go to that, um, and, and there are addiction specialists and addiction doctors who uh psychiatrists who who might be willing to to try this mm -hmm. on an outpatient um uh basis who would help him to to actually get through so that it's it's safer to to get off of um to to withdraw uh, appropriately from the alcohol so that's another really important point because if anybody's out there listening and saying i really want to stop drinking too mm -hmm. If you if it's alcohol, if it's uh, benzos, um, you really want to be careful about that, right? Because uh, uh, nobody wants you to Go die to from like that. Mm -hmm. from trying to do something really good for yourself. For sure, I think that's great advice for anyone who wrote in about alcohol dependency and stuff like that. Um, quickly, he said that he heard about. Uh, um, therapy in Europe that involve stress moderation rather than outright abstinence. Have you heard about things like that? Uh, I don't know about necessarily in Europe, but that's where moderation um, management uh, comes in. And moderation gotcha. management is an, uh, a free self-help group similar to that AA style, except it doesn't, it's not talking about abstinence. It's talking about um, if you want to moderate, how can you try that? And, right. and the idea of moderation is, all right, so I'm going to try cutting down. I'm going to track my drinks. I'm going to say, is this moderation working for me or is it not working for me? If it's not working for me, how do I know that it's not working? How do I you know, change that sure, situation? Sure. How do I make sure? How do I try and actually do this so that it, it will work out best for right. me? So um, they're, they're, are, they're here as well. Cool. Um, all right, we have a lot to get to, so I, I want to kind of keep going here. Um, let's get into uh, to pills. Sure. Uh, my mother started giving me Valium when I was very young because I was ex uh, experiencing a lot of anxiety and difficulty coping with school, like many children do. Now I'm an adult and I find I've become psychologically dependent. I've tried um, cessation with the help of my psychiatrist to no avail. Uh, I don't crave the drug, but I need to take it every day to feel quote unquote normal. I'm much more lucid when I'm not on the medication, but the withdrawal symptoms such as sleepless, sleeplessness and irritability are absolutely unbearable. Is there any hope that I can stop taking Valium or should I accept that this is something I'm going to have to do for my, my day to day life? Don't accept that this is something that you have to, there's no reason to do that. Sure. Remember, benzos is one of those ones yeah, you don't want to just come off of. And benzos is, is particularly, um, the withdrawal is particularly difficult, even if you're not having these life-threatening seizures. It could be low doses that you're on that cause um, significant uh, withdrawal symptoms, and they can last for potentially a very long time. Mm -hmm. So um, the first thing for somebody like this, I would recommend is uh, find an addiction psychiatrist. Not all psychiatrists deal with addiction. Certain psychiatrists are really trained in addiction work and in really understanding how addictions work, in knowing what you should be doing in order to help uh, do this taper. And that's the kind of person who you'd want to find. Mm -hmm. Somebody who does addictions work. I'm curious, like, how's he still getting the Valium? Right. It's, I mean, I know I can get Valium if I want to get Valium. I'm right. just saying, but it, I, I, I think about that. That was my first sort of thing. Like, well, well, I don't know if it's a it's a male or female. I'm like, how are you still getting these? You know, that's got to stop too. Well, it, again, it, it's you want to have the conversation with as many people as possible. You want to talk to your doctors, anybody who's prescribing you. If you're getting it, who's from non-prescribed places, you want to delete those numbers from your phone, yeah. block them. iPhone. 
iPhone has done like the best thing for for my work <laughs> that you could possibly do. They've made it really easy to block someone, mm. right? right? And so you can block numbers of dealers really, really easily. It used to be that you had to call up AT and T or Verizon, and and you would memorize that number. I bet. Whereas here, you're not. It's just sort of like a a, a piece of data. Uh, most of the time, people have them. Mem- if you've yeah. been calling it enough, and if it's that important <laughs> yeah, to you, you people sort of tend to memorize that. them. But if I block it, right, I can't make the call. Mm-hmm. I can't do it outgoing sure. or incoming. The but it used to be a barrier to people blocking something to say, all right, I have to call Verizon, and then I have to get on the phone with them, mm-hmm. and I have to say, can you block this number? And right, then they right. say, oh well, I don't know exactly because you know you get transferred to ten sure. different places just mm-hmm. so that they can do something that the first. person And now it's just a push done. of a button. And you're push done. of a button. Yeah. Person's blocked. Um, so I would say that would be one. Two is find this addiction psychiatrist so that you're with somebody. Even if, if you like your psychiatrist, great. Keep that person. Just go see the addiction psychiatrist sure. to help get it off of the, the benzos. And then third is find an addiction psychologist, somebody who is is trained in some of these techniques, some relapse prevention techniques, CBT, to help learn. All right, so when I'm feeling irritable, Right. When that happens, how do I tolerate that appropriately? How do I to- use positive coping skills? How do I, what are positive coping skills? How do I deal with this in a way so that I can actually make the choice mm. to um, do something different and I can actually like push myself in another direction? Gotcha. Can I make a quick plea though? Of course. A plea to the public? Please, Please do I look at that camera? You can look Please there. don't give anybody else your prescription medication. Yes. Mm. Just don't I do it. That. I endorse and that. I endorse that. People idea, do this yeah. all the time. They're like, oh, you take some of my Xanax. Right. I've got Xanax. We go it's ahead. Cool. Like, you're not a doctor. You're right. not my doctor. Please right. don't give anybody else your prescription medications. And if you are done with that prescription, throw the prescription Even out. Even if it's hmm. penicillin. Even if it's penicillin, like yes? there's no. I don't know. Need. I'm asking you that. I mean, penicillin's not going to be. Uh, I don't. I don't know of anybody who is abusing penicillin in right. that way. But there's no <laughs> be strange, reason yeah. to keep like a, a year old prescription of Valium in your yeah. um, in your right. medicine chest. Yeah. I mean, People- there's. There's a whole movement by the partnership for, at drugfree.org. Yeah. You may remember them, Partnership sure. for Drug Free America. They've mm-hmm. changed their name. We we are, work closely with them on a Parent Support Network, and um, they have a whole site dedicated to like your leftover pills and how kids are getting into those yeah. and, and starting out with serious opiate addictions because they're getting into these opiates that are just left in people's medicine chests. Yeah. So get rid of them. You know what I think is really interesting is that in this email, the person says that they're, they don't feel the cravings for it, and yet they also say that they're addicted. Is that, <laughs> there's something biological going on here, I'm assuming, but is mm-hmm. that just because you know, this person is continuing to take the, the Valium? It, there, there's probably a little bit of misunderstanding as to what a craving is. Mm-hmm. Um, cravings are, right, she's saying, when I don't take it, I feel irritable. I'm not sleeping well. Those are things that are caught. They're triggers that are causing her to have cravings. Mm-hmm. And cravings are really just your brain saying, "All right, I expect something like a dopamine burst. Right. I'm not getting it. So, like, what I'm the be honest, like, yeah. I'm not happy yeah. about this. Right. Go get me that thing that right. is going to give me this dopamine because that's good. And that is a craving. So when she's saying or she or he is saying, I, I don't feel a craving, right? It probably is a crazy. She's not sitting there saying like, "Oh, I really wish I had Valium right, right now," but she's her body is missing. is craving yeah. that whatever it's doing for her. Mm-hmm. It's like I I I feel like I honestly get that. This is gonna this is nowhere near as dangerous, but I get that with like chocolate sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Is that is that it's sad? Is but they like it, you laugh. Chocolate's freaking powerful stuff, man. I believe you. I've seen you eat chocolate before. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I mean, illness. Mr. Sweet Tooth over here knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. I thought people you know? get it with caffeine. Sure, yeah, that's yeah. right. Absolutely. Like, those my, headaches when you don't drink caffeine. What's that? You get headaches if you don't drink. You get headaches if you don't. You do, you you're intolerable. You can't talk to the person. Right. Like yeah. my wife, you cannot. She she's listening right now. Yeah. But <laughs> she's gonna not be too pleased about this. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's if, a different problem. <laughs> if if she doesn't. have have coffee in the morning it's not a very pleasant situation <laughs> and like that is her crazy. craving yeah. the coffee and saying um you know i i her body is saying like i really i, I need this it's cra- oh man we're just animals with crazy cravings right that's it There's nothing <laughs> to us all right let's keep this going here's an interesting uh situation that someone wrote in 
Uh, I wanted to know if someone who slips into a into cocaine and marijuana for let's say five months, taking these two drugs because a friend led you into that. I mean, just admit it. You know, you're doing this, and later you realized that you are doing wrong to yourself and you're stopped by your own consent after five years of not taking these drugs, is there a moment in time that a person can fall back into the temptation again, even though you haven't done these drugs for five years? Mm -hmm. So I think this person is saying, mm -hmm. I had like a five-month binge where I went nuts with coke and weed. Mm -hmm. I haven't done it in five years, but am I susceptible to, quote-unquote, relapsing? Susceptible, Yes. Right. If, if like Philip Seymour Hoffman has taught us anything, like, yeah. yeah, relapse can can happen sure. and likely will happen to some extent. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that's not across the board. It's not for everyone. But for many people, relapse happens. And for many people, when relapse does happen, it tends to go quickly down the same road. That's not this. There's there's a, a popular saying of like you're one drink to drunk. Right. If you're not drinking, but you're you're if you have one drink. That's it. You're just going to go crazy. That's actually, there's not a lot of evidence for that. Mm -hmm. What there is evidence for, though, and, and if we think about how habits are formed and the, the most current research on habits is if I take you and I, I put you in an fMRI, a functional MRI machine that is watching your brain as it's actually working. So it's showing what neural pathways are lighting up, right? Any habit that you have the, the neural pathway lights up the same, right? Mm -hmm. So you're building these grooves every time that you do something, these grooves in your brain mm -hmm. about um, like, I move this muscle, I do this thing, and this is, how, this is what I'm expecting, and so it goes down the path. So that's a, a great evolutionary thing that we've developed so that we can get really fast at things that we have to do well, like run away from a lion in the savannah, sure. right? Like you wanna know how to do that really quickly. Right. Um, where it, it comes to hurt us is if I'm doing something that, that's not so healthy or I'm doing something that it's given me a huge reward, but I, I don't want to do it anymore, mm -hmm. right? I've, those neural pathways are, are really deeply grooved mm -hmm. in and something that's as rewarding brain-wise as substances, um, you're going to have a very deeply engraved uh, ing ingrained um, neural pathway. Right. So the most recent research on, on how these works is uh, are if I'm building a new habit, Right? The old habit doesn't necessarily go away. It just gets dimmer and dimmer in the fMRI and the new neural pathways get brighter and brighter. Mm -hmm. So every time I make the choice to turn left instead of right, I'm now building new neural pathways and sort of turning left sure. instead of turning right. And, and the, but the turning right still exists in my brain. So if I then start to go back to those habits. It's just like riding a bike and you're sort of. A little bit. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I'm guaranteed to, though. Right. right. And that's the really important point is, right, there are no guarantees in this, right? I'm not, like, doomed to, oh, you used, you know, this guy used some pot and, and some Coke. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, you're, it's over. you're screwed, right? right? You're, yeah, you're back you. to using it every day, binge using it. So the idea is, again, like, I want to be really, really aware of what's going on for me. I want to be able to say, all right, am I slipping back into these behaviors? How am I doing on this? Like I used it once. Why did I use it? Like what was going on for me? What was the reward? Sure. What were the benefits? What were the costs to me? Like really kind of thinking through on any of this. How long have I been planning this, right? Mm -hmm. How long has this been going on in my head? Sure. Like really, really think through and do what we call a functional analysis of like, why did I use this time, mm -hmm. right? And then that's going to help you to prepare for the next time so that you can say, all right, I don't want to end up doing that again. Interesting. Um, I guess uh, that leads into another question we got asking specifically about marijuana. Obviously, it's not a secret. There's numbers that, uh, uh, you know, prove, uh, provide evidence. It's a very recreational drug. I think something like 70 million Americans smoke it, which mm -hmm. is crazy. To, it's like almost a third of the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this question was specifically asking, is it addicting? But like I said, we can't blind our eyes and, and be like, people don't use Coke recreationally and they are okay. I mean, look at the Rolling Stones, right? I mean, there's a lot of people who use I don't know it, that right? they're the best <laughs> example well, of, course, of but like some, <laughs> for some people, drugs some just people, like work, that's you know, right. like it, you know. So I, I guess like, you know, maybe sort of put that all in, into, you know, perspective here, like, you know, is it okay for some people to sort of do these things? You know, how do you 
how do you sort of balance the whole sort of thing? Because obviously nobody wants to be addicted to anything. No mm -hmm. one, no one strives for something like that. So maybe let's start with answering this specific question: Is marijuana addicting? And and how, what are your thoughts on like recreational drug use? So marijuana can be very addictive, right? right? And it's actually a, a really tough one for people to try and stop mm -hmm. once they've if they're at that point. Um, it, it's very difficult uh, to stop, and um, if you know, I would just be careful about it. I wouldn't be too cavalier about pot and say like, oh, it's just pot. It's, it's, um, you know, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. There's actually a really interesting side anecdote about pot and the research around pot, which is that if you want to do a government funded research and all, almost all research that we're doing in the U.S. is government funded in some way. Mm -hmm. and, um, if you want to do government funded research on pot, uh, I recently learned that you can only get the pot from these, you know, very structured government places and that they use strains of pot that are like 40 or 50 years old that are huh. from like the 60s or 70s. When like the potency has like skyrocketed. That's right. And so we're doing Since this then, research on stuff that is like totally not all that helpful. Hmm. So there's like, you know, the, whatever research they're coming out with is, is already limited by the idea of... Why is nobody talking about that? So that really is a major... Question. That is a ma because like, regardless of the potency, like that's one thing and it's getting you higher or whatever it is. But, you know, the fact that it's being, you know, uh, uh, okayed for all the medicinal values of it, it's like, well, maybe we should you know, use the latest sort of strains for what they might provide. I have no idea how they're making those decisions, but the That's last insanity. that I've heard about it was that this was the case. Do we if, know anyone who can write a story about this? Because this is crazy. I, I, I would love to to read some stories about hey, it. Because I think it's just, you know, let's have the research really yeah. reflect what, what's out there and let's like really know and let's loosen up some of these, these government... Um, Issues about uh, research so that we can we can get really good research out there. Right. We can figure out what's working and what's not working. Sure. That's a it's a side. That's anecdote. another thing. So anyway, pot, yes, can be very addictive. Um, I wouldn't be cavalier uh, about it. Uh, the other question that you asked uh, was more about like the recreational sort of drug use, regardless of what it is, obviously. Right. You know, I, a lot of people do this. I know, I have friends mm -hmm. who do it. I know people who do all kinds of drugs, and you know, for the mm -hmm. most part, they seem okay. What right. are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I'm not endorsing. Of course not. Drug of course use. not. I, I think it's going to happen. Right. And I think that everyone, the, what we want to really do is make sure that everyone is aware. Hmm. I want to raise people's awareness. Uh, you've probably heard about these things, mindfulness and mindfulness techniques. It's like all over the place. Everybody's talking about mindfulness. Mindfulness is this 3,000 year old, 5,000 year old uh, technique that comes out of Zen Buddhism that um, is really about being aware in the moment. Like what is going on for me? What's happening for me? How, like, how am I being more aware of hmm. what's happening around? How do I be in this moment? And mindfulness is, is a really important key to all of this because the more aware I am of like, all right, like I was saying before about the functional analysis, like it, it, why was I using? Right. Why am I using more? Like, am I using more than I really want to? Is mm -hmm. this going down a road that I don't particularly like? Is this happening in a way that, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like it's, it's working well for me? Or am I missing out on opportunities? Then that's a sign, all right, Maybe this is something that I want to look at. Maybe mm -hmm. this is something that I want to change. Or are other people concerned about me? Mm -hmm. Right? Are other people saying like, "Wow, you're smoking a lot of pot these yeah, days," yeah. or like, "You're on the internet like an awful lot." <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, do you sleep? Like, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Do you sleep? Or like, you played video games for how long? Yeah. yeah like we don't that's have to talk about that's that. a lot of yeah. hours of video games. Not pointing any fingers. No, at. no, no, no. That was college. <laughs> it was a dark time. Stacy didn't time. email me or anything. Cool. Good. Um, but uh, <laughs> the. The idea is that, um, you know, I start to look at this stuff and be more aware of it. I can maybe catch something before it gets too far right. down the rabbit hole. And that's where, that's the best thing that you can be doing. And so I, there's no point in me saying to people, stop, don't use recreationally. It's not going to happen. It's not going like, to happen. I, I have there to be bars. realistic. There, right? are, there bars. are bars. There is pot. It's legal in places. Right? There, people are going to get their hands on cocaine. They're going to get their hands on heroin. They're going to get their hands on pills. Like, I can't stop all of that. Mm -hmm. 
And so the best thing I can say is be really, really aware. Sure. And then if there is a problem, if there is, if it's not working out the way that you want it to be, go and talk to someone. Like, there's a lot of stigma out there that makes it feel like I can't, I don't want to talk about it. Right. It's like really embarrassing or it's really upsetting. Go talk to someone. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, and that really leads to a more general question that we've gotten from multiple listeners. Everyone really, I think a lot of people, when we first said, hey, we're going to have an addiction specialist, people didn't necessarily have specific questions about a certain drug or activity. They just wanted to know, am I, do I have a problem? Like, do I, like, I drink a beer every night. Do I have a problem? I, X, Y, Z. Obviously, we're not going to get to every last specific situation that these people have, but what is the what are the signs that you do have a problem, that you are maybe clinically addicted to something? Okay. Let's maybe generalize that and get that information okay. out there. So th there, there are about 11 different criteria, and you have to meet two of them in order to qualify as having Only a substance two? use disorder. Hmm. That seems very, right. yeah. They, well, they, okay. they changed the, the way that it works a little bit um, in the most recent, uh, in the DSM-5. The DSM yep. is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. That's that um, disease Bible. It's the disease Bible, yeah. yeah the Mental Health Disease Bible. I want, that's, a, that's a trip, that book, man. It, it, don't read it. You, I've never like read it, but you, I've like yeah. thumbed through it. I'm start, like, Jesus, do I have this? <laughs> well, you start going yeah. through it and you're like, oh my God, I have this. Yeah, I have oh my God, I have this. Yeah, oh, I've news. got this. It's bad it's, news. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't read it. Um, but uh, the, I'm not going to list all 11 of them because I, I think it doesn't make for great radio. Right. But uh, the, the idea, and you can look them up online pretty easily, but the, the idea of almost all of them is, is this happening more than I want it to? Mm -hmm. Is it happening in ways that I didn't want it to? Is it getting in the way of my life? Mm. Is it causing problems for me? Am I doing it more often than I was before? Do I feel like I can stop? Have I tried to stop and I can't? Mm -hmm. Am I having withdrawal symptoms from it? Right. When I stop using, do I get shaky? Do I feel irritable? Sure. Do I have trouble sleeping? And if you're starting to meet some of those things, then the answer is you should go talk to someone. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm not saying that you do or you don't have anything. I'm just saying go talk to someone. Go have a conversation. And if it's, if it's about substances or if it's about compulsive behaviors, try to find somebody who specializes in that. Mm -hmm. right? Because there are specialized techniques. Mm -hmm. There are specialized things that people do that are more effective, that are um, filled with actually a very different way of thinking about substances. I think for, especially for substance abuse, there's, there's like a moralistic um, thing that goes on in our country sure. where it's like, uh, that's, that's a really bad thing. Like, I don't want to touch that. Right. Go find somebody who, who does that on a regular basis mm. and, and you'll hopefully get a much less judgmental, um, not that everybody is judgmental, but you'll find, you know, actually a lot more kindness, a lot more, um, uh, feeling like, like it's going to work out. Like there's, there's a positive way of dealing with this and, and find those people sure. seek out those people who are addiction specialists and go talk to them mm -hmm. say, you know, I, do I have a problem? And if I do have a problem or I feel like it's a problem because, you know, here's the things that I, I noticed are, are a problem in my life. Right. How do I help with that? Or, or one of, uh, hold that thought real quick. Are there one of the, one of the criteria, uh, uh, is it making me poor? Is that one of the criteria? Like I'm spending all my money on this thing? Yeah, it's a, it's about time and money. Yeah. Right? Have I spent excessive amounts of time? Have I spent excessive amounts of money? Am I not able to meet my other obligations right. because I'm doing this? Can I not pay rent because right. I'm buying all X, Y, Z? What were you going to say? I was going to ask about the difference in the treatment between you know, substance abuse and uh, behavioral addiction. Mm -hmm. um, we got a, f a couple of emails from people that were saying that they're addicted to just being on their phones and that's just because they pick it up mm -hmm. every five minutes to check something else. Um, you know, is, is the treatment different for that kind of thing? And do addiction medicine specialists sort of hold that in a just as high a regard as substance abuse? So uh, uh, internet addictions and um, technology addictions are, are relatively new. In fact, they didn't quite make it into the, the new DSM because they, there just wasn't enough evidence to be mm. able to say like, and this is the criteria that you need yeah. in order to say, I, you have this or, or you're, you're dealing with this. Right. So it didn't make it in um, specifically. There, there's references to it and they call it like problematic internet use, but it's, it's not very well defined. The, there's also not a specific evidence-based treatment that is for 
internet addiction mm-hmm. or problematic internet use or phones. I think phones are tough, right? My phone's in my pocket. I felt it buzz a couple of times. I thought I, I felt it buzz when I said something about my wife and I was like, yeah. oh, I, I, <laughs> I gotta like, go. I better check <laughs> that, that real that phantom quick. Vibration <laughs> syndrome. Phantom vibration syndrome. Yeah, yeah. It, it's crazy. But it's, it's a, it's that same thing, right? If we yeah. think about, uh, the reward, the reward system in your brain, right? Dopamine is, is the main t- neurotransmitter, the main player in, in that, mm-hmm. right? If I, anything that I'm doing that's interesting, exciting, that I like, if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody who I think is attractive, if I'm walking down the street and I see like a, a donut in a window that looks really delicious, right. I, am, I get a burst of dopamine, right? Because I'm thinking about how awesome is it going to be when I get to have that? Or yeah. what would it be like if I was with that person, right? It, it's like just awesome. And so I get this dopamine burst, right? Well, if I use a substance that actually manufactures a dopamine burst, when my phone vibrates in my pocket, I'm thinking, Oh, somebody's writing to me. I wonder if it's interesting. Like who's right. calling me? Like, I got to check this out. I'm already, I'm pre dopamine bursting yeah, right. because I'm already anticipating how awesome that's going to be. I get that feeling when I like, I think I'm addicted to Amazon. I'm thinking of addicted to buying stuff on Amazon Prime and just like loving like getting packages and like seeing yeah. like the do- like the delivery note. When I was a, when I was a kid, I, I went to summer camp and when the packages would come, if you thought oh. there was a package, it was yeah. like, amazing because oh there was candy in there. Yeah, there's who knows what's yeah. in it. It's just so exciting. <laughs> the possibilities were endless. Yeah, and and so before you even get to the package, right. you're just like so pumped up. And people say that about substances, right? right? Yeah. That before the just knowing that you've called your dealer and that that's happening, like you're already feeling the wheels that, start turning that yeah. you are releasing dopamine because mm-hmm. your body already knows what it's about to do. Right. So it's, it's just licking it's, its lips. Yeah. yeah. It's just getting ready. So with the phones and things, it, it's the exact same process. Mm-hmm. And so we actually want to deal with it the same way. We want to think about, all right, what is the trigger? Right. How am I going to handle it differently? How do I tolerate, right? I didn't pick up my phone, mm-hmm. right? I had to tolerate the fact that like my phone was in my pocket. I had to right. use skills and I had to refocus my direct, my, my attention on, you know, what the question was and how am I responding? Cause it would have been real easy for me to be like, uh, yeah, no, my, my uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Cause I totally lost where I was sure. in, in the phone. So it's using skills like that and practicing it on a daily basis to mm-hmm. be able to say, all right, how do I do this? How do I start with something small and then slowly work my way up and, and get bigger and bigger so that I can then handle the fact that like, all right, the new video game came out and I just got it and I want to play. I just want to play. Yeah. I just want to play for a week. Yeah. And I can't do that because I'll lose my job. I'll lose my wife. I'll lose my kids. I'll lose all this stuff mm-hmm. if I just disappear for a week into video game land. And, you know, I'm pulled to do that. How do I not do that? How do I figure out another way of dealing with it. So it's the same kind of skills. I feel like internet addiction is tough because so much of it is what you just said. It's it's addiction to stimuli. And there's so much of that to be had on the internet. I, I think for a lot of people, their addiction on the web is Reddit. Just because, you know, you have no idea what's going to be on there today. It's constantly updating. There's something that's happening right now as we're recording this podcast that we're not reading. And, and that that effect is is really palpable. That's why Facebook, that's right. why Twitter is so exciting, right? right. Twitter's Social happening 24-7, 365, mm-hmm. and there's like millions of people who are just tweeting out ideas, and you're like, wow, I can't, I can't, I can't miss that. Right. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's very difficult because um, there is this stimulus, and you're, you then have to tolerate the idea of, I'm pulling back from this. Yeah, it's okay not to know. I know, but I know it's happening, right? Right? Because I, I, it's not like I just forgot right. that Facebook is there, mm-hmm. but I'm choosing to step back from it. I'm choosing to make this choice. And then I have to tolerate the feeling that comes with that, right. which includes your body saying like, whoa, like, yeah, what? I'm missing it. What are you yeah. doing? Right. Go yeah. back to Facebook. Right. The treatment for that must be so tough. I mean, obviously substance abuse recovery is really difficult as well, but just the fact that you have to be faced with using a computer so much in modern life, mm-hmm. if you're addicted to the internet, you know, you have Facebook available to you at all times, whether it's in your phone or at work on your computer. Mm-hmm. How do you get away from that if you are clinically diagnosed with an internet addiction? Yeah, Just you, don't use computers at all. It's kind of hard. You can't be clinically diagnosed with an internet addiction, right? Okay. That's what it was. It's not in the DSM five, mm. and you know, yeah. and, and I want to, yeah. <laughs> DSM it's funny because people six. still die from that, though. People die from video game addiction. You think that would be the only criteria for they, being in the book? They do. It's not just that, though, right? They're they're doing right. other. The things. internet didn't right. kill them. It was the fact that they didn't eat anything. Right. 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 You know, it's it, it, and the reason that I'm going to be a stickler about that is because I, I people get very um, 
They say like, oh, I'm an addict or I'm a this or, and, and like, I've been diagnosed alcoholic. You can't actually be diagnosed alcoholic. There mm. is no diagnosis for alcoholic. Alcoholic carries a certain level of stigma. Now for many people, that term, that phrase is supremely helpful. Mm -hmm. Right, and they find it like, all right, now I can identify with something. Yeah. I can understand. There are people, other people who are like me. Right, I'm not just some kind of weird like f up in the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm an alcoholic. That's yeah. helpful. But for other people, they're saying, I don't, I don't feel that. I don't feel like an alcoholic with all the things that go with alcoholic. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys were talking about um, right around when Philip Seymour Hoffman died. I remember listening to the show. I, does everybody know I listen to the show? We do. We found that's that awesome. that's pretty awesome. Yeah, no, we I, like I, I love the Thank show. You, I'm not sure what I'm going to do on my commute home today. Yeah, you I don't know if I'm going to listen to me. You but. should. <laughs> you should. That'll well, freak you right out. Yeah, I, just, uh, I don't know if I need that. But um, right, right around that time, you guys were thinking, saying things and people were talking. There was a lot of stuff out there that people were talking about, mm -hmm. like, Gosh, he just didn't look like he was a heroin addict. Like I have this image super in my head, right? right, of what a heroin addict right. looks like because he wasn't shivering in an alley somewhere. That's right. right. Yeah. Like he wasn't doing. He wasn't kind of leaning over and mm. and you know on the street and he was a high functioning person and right. But that's exactly it, and that's why I'm so careful with the words that I choose is because for a certain population. And, and it's a large population. The terms and the stigma around words like addict or alcoholic or, you know, heroin addict or mm -hmm. drug user or things like that are going to make them say, I'm not that. Mm. I'm not that picture that I have in my head. And so I'm, I, I, even though I kind of want things to change, I can't go get help because if I tell anybody, hmm. that's what they're going to think I am. Right. And so I don't want anything to do with that. And so I'm not going to do it. And so there's a, my big thing is like, we have to be thoughtful about like the words and, and these things about like diagnosis and, mm -hmm. and addict and uh, addiction and, and alcoholic and all these different words because I, I don't want the stigma. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that actually there's a lot of hope and right. that there's kindness. Like kindness is going to help you For significantly. Sure. Do you also think that, you know, we talk about Flappy Bird and, uh, you know, the guy who started that, the developer, he completely, you know, turned away from $50,000 a day. And his reason was because he felt the game was too addictive. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about things like that? Do you oh, think he's that's still a, getting $50,000. Yeah, yeah, he's still getting $50,000. I got for Flappy sure. Bird on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. And whenever I play, I think he's about that. Getting, and yeah. I'm like, oh, you're still getting this he's, money. Yeah, right. He's still getting I mean, people throw that word around a lot. You know, I'm addicted to this video game. I'm addicted to Flappy Bird. They may not be addicted to it. They may just have a habit. And that's probably two separate things that people should recognize. Right. They are two separate things that people should recognize. I'm also aware that like we're not going to change everyone's vernacular. Yeah. We're not going to change every the way everyone talks. Sure. And yeah. that's okay, but I want to be I want people to know that there's like like addiction or addict. The word addict. Addiction is is a slightly different thing, but the word addict it's a label. Mm -hmm. And for some people it's outrageously helpful. Mm -hmm. Right? People can identify with it and they can understand it and it's it's super helpful. But for other people, it's a barrier to getting help. Right. Yeah. And so I'm I'm not opposed to it in in theory. I just don't like the stigma around sure. it. And I, I would I would love to change that idea of the stigma that comes along with substance use. That there's there's help and there's hope and that you know there are treatments out there that are really helpful. Yeah, we definitely, you know, put that in a really rotten place, that that label for sure. Yeah, I I, I think so. Um so you're saying that uh, an, uh, alcoholism is not a diagnosis. No, you can't be diagnosed, so it's not alcoholic. a disease. You, that's a very um, tricky uh, part of okay, this whole thing. Okay, so we won't... Well, the, the short answer is that um, the AMA has labeled uh, substance abuse a disease. Right. But not everybody is talking about the same idea of disease sure. when they're saying it's a disease. Right. right? Some people are mushing in other things, right? Some people are saying it's a brain disease. Some people are saying that it's just like, you know, having diabetes or something and you need to, to be thoughtful, like it's going to be there forever. Some people are saying it's a remitting and relapsing disease. Hmm. Some people are saying that there's actually a moral component to this disease, right? That hmm. you are, like there's a moral piece wow. to what's going on and that you are, you know, uh, morally having, uh, having issues that you have to deal with. And so, I'm very careful with the disease model because while I do think that there are for some people, right, your brain is just functioning and set up in a way that, you know, this is, you're going to really struggle with this and that's just going to be 
the situation and, mm -hmm. and, and that you are going to always have this struggle. And that might be somewhat produced by you, by I've used so heavily and so long that I've, I've really addled my brain in, in a way that I can't necessarily get it all back mm -hmm. or that it's by, it was, you were predisposed to right. it, right? There's, there's a lot or the combination of the two, but I I'm careful about the disease model. So is it hereditary? Can it be hereditary? Certain parts of it are hereditary. Yeah. Then again, if we were to go back through everyone's family tree mm. and look back at, at mental health issues that go back throughout everyone's family tree, almost everybody you know has somebody who's a relatively close, like linear relative who had some kind of substance abuse problem, mm. who had some kind of mental health problem like schizophrenia or mm. major depression, right? These are all, then they're all sort of have these markers of having some kind of hereditary piece to it. Right. Not everybody is schizophrenic. Sure. Right. Not everybody has um, a substance use problem. So there, you have to have more than just having it be hereditary for it to become a real issue. I'm sure a lot of it is also exposure to those substances when you're younger. And if you grow up with that in your house, mm -hmm. then it's not necessarily you know passed down to you genetically but perhaps situationally? It, it absolutely can be. It can be about, again, about reward. Mm -hmm. And right, I, no one else in my immediate family has any kind of substance use problem, but I got into it and the reward was so powerful for me mm -hmm. that I just kept going back to the well and I didn't know any other way to help with this issue. And then once it kind of got out of out of my own control. It was no longer about the reward, but then every time I'd stop, I just felt like crap. Yeah. Hmm. And so now I need that in order to just kind of feel okay in the day. And then I need something else in order to help me feel better about the stuff that's still in my life. Gotcha. So w when, when I'm dealing with somebody who is struggling with a substance use problem, I'm really thinking about, so how does this fit into your whole life, mm -hmm. right? This is not an isolated thing. You have a whole life that's going on, yeah. and how are you benefiting from these substances? That's another thing that seems isn't talked be, about a lot. It seems to be the, the big sort of crux of the whole thing is how is it affecting your life outside of, like, the time when you're doing the substances? Right. What is it doing to And not life? just in the negative way. Right. Like, how are you benefiting For sure. from this? And, like, they don't talk about that a lot. Mm. Like people don't talk about like, Hey, like what, how do you benefit from, right. you know, 10 hours on the internet? Mm -hmm. How do you benefit from, you know, smoking crack? Mm. Right. What do you get from it? Right. And if we think about what do you get from it, then we can start to think about, all right, so how can we replace that? Sure. Mm -hmm. How can we even think about replacing that? Interesting. I want to get to another specific um, uh, question, and uh, we're actually running out of time. We'll try and get to maybe one more after this. This is from a musician who's been doing, um, uh, who's been a musician for 10 years. Uh, he plays guitar in a band at bars and weddings and other functions. It's probably the only job in the world where you get paid to drink. Because as you may or not know, bars give bands riders and they are allowed a certain amount of drinks every night. So if I'm out three nights a week at a bar or a wedding and I'm playing in the band, I have a couple of drinks. So after years and years of this, I now feel the urge to drink every night. Not to get blind drunk, but it's like a little itch that needs to be scratched. I feel like it's not a big enough problem to go and make a fuss about it, but I've tried to stop, but I can't. Am I addicted to alcohol? And from this uh, story, is it a big enough problem that I actually need to go out and seek help for something like this? Okay. So the, for me, the question isn't about are you addicted or are you not addicted, right? There are, I brought these in, uh, the, the NIAAA, which is a, a governmental organization that oversees alcohol and, and um, uh, alcohol abuse, it has some guidelines and some standards that says that if you are a man and you drink no more than four drinks in a day or 14 drinks in a week, then you're considered a low risk drinker. So mm. that means if you have two drinks a day, seven days a week, you're a low risk drinker. Wow, that still okay. seems like a lot to me. It's still a lot. Right, that's moderate drinking. That's the the national guideline for moderate drinking. And you know, for some people, right, the guy who's drinking half a liter of vodka a day, mm. right, he's surpassing that easily. Yeah. Right, because for vodka, right, beer is you know this big, and you're having two of those, or right. you're having five of those, whatever Vodka's it is that you're having. It, right? Vodka is a shot. Yeah. And so if you're having half a liter, think of how many shots are in <laughs> that's, there. Yeah, that's a lot right? of booze. For women, it's three drinks for a day and seven drinks for a week. Mm -hmm. So if you're within those guidelines, then you're within moderate drinking. 
right? So he's, if he's saying, I drink no more than two drinks a day and I never go over that and I'm, I'm doing that, then he would fit under federal guidelines as, as a moderate low risk drinker, mm-hmm. right? Of course, if he has one more drink on any night, then he's surpassing that. But that's a, it's not like a one and done thing. Right. It's uh, you know, are you doing that regularly? It's an are you sort right? Of like, yeah. are you sort of fitting underneath that scale? If he's writing into the podcast and saying, "I've actually tried to stop," I'm I'm aware that it's like I I feel like there's a problem here. Then there's probably something there that that he's not particularly liking in his life and mm-hmm. the way that this is set up and feeling like, I feel like I have to do this. I feel that itch. It to sounds do like it. it's scaring him. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would be scared too. If I felt like every I time that I that. go mm-hmm. out, like I just feel this itch to like, I really kind of feel like I need one or I want one. And like, I, I don't know that I want to tonight, but I feel like I have to. And if I've tried, I, I can't. So what I would say for that person is right the guidelines, the statistics, are you addicted? Are you not? They're, they're less important to me than, you know, how is this affecting your life? Mm-hmm. And if it's affecting your life, then I would say, like, go talk to an addiction specialist. I would start out and say, like, all right, I need to talk to an addiction psychiatrist. I need to talk to somebody and say, like, first of all, how dangerous is it for me to not drink yeah. right now? Because remember, alcohol, withdrawal, withdrawal, you yeah. don't want to don't want to get into to a worse situation. Mm-hmm. But then I also am going to say, like, all right, and let me go to a, a psychologist or an addiction psychiatrist who specializes in these types of motivational interviewing. And um, that's one of the evidence-based treatments or this community reinforcement approach. That's another evidence-based approach or CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. Let me go to the people who are, are working in these modalities and say, all right, Help me figure out how to do this, mm-hmm. right? I need some help on how on skills because my life is not conducive to not drinking. Right. So it's going to be an extra effort to figure out how to do that. You know, you talk a lot about like people realizing that it's changing their lives. Like you, you reiterate, is it is it changing my life? Is it affecting the people around me? Aren't there some people that don't realize that? Aren't there some people that are so compromised by their substance abuse that they can't? make those decisions? Yes and no. Yeah. Right? There's a great article in New York Magazine right now um, by the, the photographer Graham uh, Mac. McIndoe, mm-hmm. um, where he actually, he, he took self photographs of himself using heroin. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's very powerful. And then he sits down with his girlfriend who was with him before and then they broke up and now they're back together and he's totally sober and he's talking about it. And, and she's asking him these very personal questions about like, did you know, I mean, did you want to stop? And he's like, of course I wanted to stop. Like I, you always know, but then it's really hard to. So I would say that the majority of people have some level of awareness Mm -hmm. that things are not going great. Maybe not so much in the beginning. Maybe it takes a little bit of time. The idea that you have to hit bottom, I I don't actually believe that. And I think that that's um, a really tough one, especially if you're a family member watching and people are telling you like, nope, they've got to hit bottom. Right. Like I can't, like if it was my kids, I wouldn't be able to just sit there and let them hit bottom. That's, that feels scary and dangerous to me. Like what if their bottom is, death. Yeah. Like I don't I don't want that. Of course. So I want to to figure out ways that I can I can be involved and um he talks about this idea that there is some level of awareness, but it's actually just really tough and I don't know where to turn. And so we want to make sure that people have ways and places to turn. Mm-hmm. But on that note, I'd like to plug. Yeah, go if that's for okay. it. Absolutely. Right? I'd like to plug, first of all, if you have a, a substance abuse problem or if you are concerned about it, one place to go is you can come to our website, motivationandchange.com. What we've got up there, um, we, we talk about our own services. We have an inpatient um, uh, rehab that literally just opened a couple weeks ago or last week um, that is up in uh, the Berkshires uh, in Massachusetts. We have outpatient services. And we have a whole group of online services that we're really working to to. Uh, push and build because we want to um, help make sure that everybody who wants something has some access. And so I would go to our blog, the CMC blog, um, and you can read articles that we've written and we, uh, that some of them are tips for change for individuals. Some of them are things to be thinking about. Some of them are for family, right? all kinds of things about um, what you can do to, to 
think about for yourself to, to make change. Mm. The other place that I would recommend, if you are a family member, if you're somebody who's worried about somebody else, if you're a friend, if you're a, literally anybody who's worried about somebody else, we have a book that just came out. Um, it's called Beyond Addiction. It's uh, The subtitle is How Science and Kindness Help People Change. And it's just a spectacular book that really is about how can you, as somebody who cares about somebody else, help them make change. And it's, it's just a powerful book that says you have the ability to help somebody make change without them having to hit rock bottom, without mm -hmm. them having to go through all this. And we, and we want people to, to really just learn about what kind of things they can do to help. Mm -hmm. So um, there are some things out there. And on our website, we also have links to other resources that people uh, that are available for people, whether it's we have AA, we have NA, we have 12 step meetings, we have, you know, evidence based treatment uh, things, we have self help groups. It's about what works. It's not I'm not here to push an ideology on evidence based treatment. I'm here about what is going to work for different people so that we sure. can help them get the help that they need. Excellent. You can also follow the Center for Motivation and Change. That's at underscore the CMC. And uh, again, the website for that book, Beyond Addiction, is beyondaddictionbook.com. What's that? We made it on the Twitter page. Jill live tweeted our show <laughs> while we were recording this. Here we are. There this is, is some meta stuff right now. That's awesome. <laughs> and just a little side note, we talked all about like addiction and like food addiction and stuff like that. And Dr. Uh, King decided to bring us a bunch of donuts so yeah. that we could somehow uh, play into I see what kind of racket you're running. Here, <laughs> uh, it's all cyclical. Right. It makes sense now. No, thank you for being here, man. This was absolutely so it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, helpful and uh, it's some really powerful stuff and, and great advice. We really appreciate that. And on behalf of our listeners, thanks for helping answer. It's, it's my pleasure. And I, I'm really, I, I'm so impressed because uh, I think this is a really tough thing to, to go out there for and sure. talk about and people really put themselves out there. And thank you. Thank yeah. you, 404 listeners. I, re I mean, putting uh, uh, their sort of like well-being in our hands is definitely a big risk for them so <laughs> I can't uh, I can't extend that uh, I think they put their well-being in, in my yeah hands. but like to be the vessel <laughs> even to be the vessel for that is mind blowing but thanks again to everyone who wrote in and you can keep writing in and we'll somehow get them to yeah, Josh absolutely. and, and we'll, we'll, we'll make it work find a way to, to help everyone out awesome well thank you doctor for being here that's going to do it for us we're back here tomorrow with a brand new show the 404 at cnet.com is the email address follow us on Facebook Twitter Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, and all that good stuff. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Jeff Bacalar. And I'm Justin Yu. Thanks again to Mr. Uh, King. Thank you so much for being here, man. Thank you. Awesome Pleasure. stuff. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Later. Bye-bye. Right.